again and welcome back. In yesterday's uh, episode, we began talking about this idea of retribution theology and specifically as it's related to the book of Job. Uh, if you need a refresher on what retribution theology is, uh, I invite you to go back and, and uh, have a listen through yesterday's episode again. This whole week on 1225 Live, we're devoting our time uh, to explore what the book of Job teaches us about this subject. Before we begin today, let's pray as we always do. Father, no one has counseled you because you need no counsel. Uh, no one has instructed you, Lord, because you have all knowledge. We bow before you as we begin today and we ask your uh, mighty presence with us. Help us, Lord, as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we promised yesterday, uh, we're going to look at retribution theology, first of all, as it appears in Job's friend, Eliphaz. Eliphaz is the first friend who speaks to Job after Job is uh, stricken with such great suffering. And Eliphaz's first speech begins in Job chapter 4. Uh, today, what I want to do is uh, to just zero in on one of the key passages where Eliphaz shows us pretty clearly that he subscribes to retribution theology. And the passage I have in mind is Job chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. Eliphaz asks Job a question in verse 6. He says, Is not your fear of God your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? Notice here that Eliphaz talks about a couple of things. Job's confidence, and Eliphaz also talks about Job's hope. Eliphaz assumes that Job's confidence is linked to Job's fear of Yahweh. And Eliphaz also infers that Job's hope is linked directly to the integrity of Job's ways. The idea here is, Job, if you live in the fear of God like you say you do, then no doubt even during this moment, even in this period of your suffering, you have confidence. And if you, Job, are truly walking blamelessly, if you have an integrity about your ways, then your hope in this situation will also be secure. Now notice already here, we can detect the quid pro quo uh, sort of thinking that Eliphaz has. But watch verse 7 now, where Eliphaz's position becomes even more clear. Eliphaz says to Job now, remember, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? Eliphaz asks these two rhetorical questions here, and he expects that Job will answer both of the questions in a very confident and resounding sort of a way. So question one, who, Job, who that was innocent ever perished? And Eliphaz expects that Job will surely answer, well, no one who was innocent ever perished. Question two, where were the upright cut off? Eliphaz expects that Job will surely answer, Nowhere. The upright weren't cut off. Cutting off is only for the wicked. Can you see the retribution theology that's at work in Eliphaz here? Eliphaz is suggesting to Job that, hey, it's a universal, unbending rule that upright, innocent people, righteous people, blameless people, that, that they don't perish, that they don't get cut off like wicked people do. It's only wicked people who get cut off and who perish. Righteous people don't. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 8. As I have seen, Eliphaz continues, so in other words, here are my observations. 
Those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Again, simple calculus, according to Eliphaz, simple math. It's universally, unbendingly true in his thinking, you reap what you sow, and you reap what you sow always at all times. Bad outcomes are reaped by those who plow and sow bad things themselves. In Eliphaz's theology, there, there's this simple cause and effect sort of relationship that, that is universal, it's unbending. When a person acts in evil ways, that person reaps evil things. Verse 9, he continues, By the breath of God, they, that is the workers of evil who were just mentioned in verse 8, they perish. And by the blast of his, of God's anger, they are consumed. For Eliphaz, it's simple. God makes sure that within this world, punishment comes to workers of evil. Now remember here, in verse 6, Eliphaz had appealed to Job's innocence, to Job's righteousness as being the safeguard for Job um, against perishing, against being cut off. Righteous people don't perish and get cut off, only wicked people do. Well, I trust that having looked at this brief passage, uh, it's been sufficient to show us Eliphaz's retribution theology. Again, for Eliphaz, the calculus is always very simple. You suffer because you've sinned, and you are blessed because you live righteously. The problem, as we said yesterday, the problem is that it's not always that simple. Nor are we in any sort of a position to determinatively pronounce, oh, the reason this particular disaster has befallen these particular people is that they sinned in this particular way. We're not in a position to make that pronouncement. We don't have access, direct access, to God's filing cabinet. We need to exercise real caution when making such statements. In fact, I want you to listen here. As we read the book of Job, it becomes crystal clear that Job is not suffering the terrible things that he's suffering because of any sin in his life. Job is suffering. He is suffering, and he's suffering tremendously as he lives in the world. We can be very sure of that. He's suffering tremendously, but that suffering is not punishment for any specific sin or sins on his part. This is one of the things that God is trying to, to teach us and to make clear to us in the book of Job. Not all suffering results from sin. Not all suffering results from sins. Job's didn't. Listen, Job teaches us, in fact, that there is such a thing as innocent suffering. What's really important for us to see in the book of Job is this, that there is a unified agreement. There is a complete and total agreement between the narrator of Job and Job himself, and God also. And the agreement that all three come to is that Job is innocent. He's not suffering because of sins. He is suffering, but he's not suffering because of sins. So in Job 1.1, 1, 1, the narrator tells us that Job is blameless and upright that Job fears God and turns away from evil. Wow, that's pretty, uh, a pretty high amount of praise there. But that's the narrator's assessment of Job. And then at 6.30, and again at 9.15, Job himself agrees with the narrator's assessment. Job uh, infers that there is no injustice on his tongue. And in 9.15, he asserts that he is in 
the right. So Job and the narrator agree. Job is innocent. And then, as we said, God himself agrees with both the narrator and with Job when, when God says in 1.8 that there's no one like Job, that Job is blameless and upright. Job is a man who fears God and turns away from evil. And then at the end of the book, at 42.7, God says that Job had spoken right about God all along. And so friends, notice this. It's this man, this innocent, upright, righteous, God-fearing man named Job, who suffers so terribly. Why has this pandemic come? Is this pandemic due retribution for specific human sins? Perhaps it is. It might be. But we can't ultimately say, uh, with the book of Job before us, we can't ultimately say that that's the case. And it's presumptuous of us uh, if we do. It is very true, no doubt, that sometimes the suffering that people experience does come as a result of specific sins that they commit. We wouldn't want to deny that. But it's not always the case. And we must not be presumptuous in making such a judgment. To claim that we have such confident insight uh, into the counsel of God is, is never a wise thing for us to be doing. The precise reasons for human suffering in this world are often much more mysterious than we admit. Well, we're going to leave it there for today. I know we've gone longer today. Thank you for joining us. Be blessed, and Lord willing, we'll see you again tomorrow.